Why are we here? Why are we all tuned into this convention? Because our souls hunger and thirst after righteousness. We hunger and thirst, as Brother Ron read, as the, the heart uh, thirst for the brooks in the, the wilderness. And that's what we're seeking for, that refreshing word of God and the messages that comfort us and encourage us and guide us in our daily lives. James said this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. And that is our goal when we come together. The truth is very intellectually stimulating, but it is not intellectual stimulation we truly seek. We seek the wisdom of our Heavenly Father that guides us in our behavior, that guides us in our thinking, that guides us in every principle of daily life. And understanding those principles, we want to put them into action in our daily lives. Because that's what it's all about, to follow in the footsteps of Christ our Lord. The parable of the prodigal is very precious to me. I can remember as a child, um, my father took us to the Lutheran church at that time. And I remember very well the Sunday school lessons and the readings of uh, the parable of the prodigal son and the encouragements for me personally to be a good son and an obedient son to my father. But I think the parable is actually mistitled. We refer to it as the parable of the prodigal son. And I always thought prodigal meant uh, the one who goes away and comes back again, the son who keeps returning. But that's not the meaning of the word prodigal, apparently. The word prodigal is there because of his prodigious spending. And that's the focus that many translations of the scriptures have put on this parable. The son who spent a lot of money. But I don't think that that's really an adequate title for this parable. I would look beyond the son and look at the great example and wisdom of his father. I personally refer to this as the parable of the merciful father. We'd like to spend some time and read it just to refresh our memories. Starting in Luke 15, verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless spending. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that land, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the, fig, the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe 
and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older brother was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. We'd like to look at six highlighted lessons from this parable. Um, you may find a different six, but these are the six that appealed to me. Lesson number one. One of the greatest temptations young people face is over eagerness to have the privileges and wealth of life, but not by earning it or being accountable for the responsibilities associated with wealth and privilege. And I might say that that could expand beyond just young people expecting to get something for nothing in this life and not bearing responsibility for that which has been put in our stewardship. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, we read, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And he's admonishing all the brethren, not just the young ones there, but flee youthful lusts. Youthful lusts are looking for a temporary fix or temporary satisfaction or instant gratification. But as we get older, we realize what things are truly more valuable. And those things are the words and favor of our Heavenly Father. Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, our Lord's parable, uh, I'm sorry, our Lord's great uh, Sermon on the Mount. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust do corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. James echoes this theme of resisting instant gratification or the wealth and privileges of this world in James chapter 2, verse 5. He says, Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? And again, the wise counsel of Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 7 through 10, he says this very well. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money 
is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Let us put the things of the Lord as premier in their uh, preeminence in our daily lives. We brought nothing into this world and we'll take nothing out of it. I did see a very uh, humorous photograph online and it was uh, an Avis moving truck in a funeral procession. Uh, somebody might have tried to take it all with them, but you can't. Let us have the things that are true riches, and that is the wisdom of God. Lesson number two. It is not wise to leave your father's house. That is, do not leave the strong and godly principles that you were raised with. You know, so many times young people want to get out of their parents' home just so that their father can't exert influence over them any longer. And how unfortunate that is. Our wise Heavenly Father has given us such treasure, such wealth. It is not wise that we leave our father's house. All right. We read Proverbs 3, verses 1 through 5. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Continuing with this theme of it's not wise to leave your father's house, that is the godly principles that we were raised with, Proverbs chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. A fool despises his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Our father's house, what a blessed place to be. Psalm 27 verse 4 is a scripture that resonates in my heart and that I have loved for the last five decades that I've been in association with the Brotherhood. It reads, One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Oh, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our life. What a blessed condition. Continuing in the Psalms, Psalm 23 expresses the wishes and desires of those who would be the Lord's disciples. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And lastly in the Psalms, the relative value of time spent with the Lord versus time spent with things of this world. Psalm 84 verse 10. A day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God 
than dwell in the houses, the tents of wickedness. A day in his courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. And how true that is. That resonates deeply in all our hearts, I'm sure. Lesson two, it's not wise to leave your father's house. Le lesson number three, sometimes we get ourselves into very difficult and unpleasant situations. God's grace is more than able to deliver us out of them. Proverbs 11, 22, like a gold ring in a pig's snout, is a beautiful woman without discretion. We have been given tremendous powers of discretion because we have learned the value or the values that our Heavenly Father appreciates. And so if we're a beautiful woman, perhaps that could be symbolic of the prospective bride of Christ, the church of Christ, you could be beautiful, but how inappropriate if you don't exercise discretion with the beauty. Let us avoid difficult and unpleasant situations. If our right hand offends us, cut it off. If our tongue offends us, cut it out. Continuing on in the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 32 through 34. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. And I say this. To your shame. So much of that attitude prevails in the world today. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And this relates somewhat to the immediate gratification that we were talking about in our first lesson. Live for today, carpe diem. Grab what you can today. But brethren, we so much appreciate that message from the Apostle. Don't be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Hanging out with the wrong crowd is not healthy for our spirituality. Let us seek the fellowship of the Lord's people. Continuing in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, Apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh. And we've had many interesting speculations in our fellowship. Uh, some brethren have made various applications of this and many wonderful, well-studied discourses. But whatever his thorn in the flesh was, it troubled him and made him feel that he could not serve the Lord as effectively as he desired. He prayed three times to have that removed from him but the Lord finally said to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Sometimes we get ourselves in difficult situations, unpleasant situations. But never let us feel that we are beyond the grace of God. Brethren, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And the blood of his son cleanses us from all unrighteousness. What a beautiful, beautiful scriptural promise. And lastly, the Apostle James weighs in on this. James chapter 4, verse 6. God gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 
And in the prodigal son's destitute condition, in his miserable circumstance, when he would have craved to even eat the food that the pigs ate, a moment of clarity came to him. He realized his pride and his arrogance and his foolishness. And he humbled himself. And in that condition of humility, his heart was prepared to return to the fellowship of his father's house. Lesson number four. The action of true repentance and turning to Jehovah God to change your life is very powerful. Now you may have noticed that I put much emphasis on the word true repentance. Because repentance um, has to be full and true from the heart. Let's read a few scriptures along these lines. First Corinthians chapter two. I'm sorry. Second Corinthians chapter seven, verses eight through ten. We remember in first Corinthians ch chapter five, Paul rebuked the brethren for their tolerance of a brother who was living in an immoral condition. And in 2 Corinthians, he reprises that, he revisits that to temper their treatment of this brother, to temper their estimation of themselves and their spiritual validity. So 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 10, for even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. There are two different types of grief spoken of here, godly grief and worldly grief. What's the difference? Godly grief is grieving because we feel a sense of having offended, disappointed, let down our Heavenly Father, that we have not brought honor to his name. Worldly grief is rooted in self-pity. We grieve because perhaps we've lost our reputation. We grieve because we've lost a financial or social advantage. We grieve because we care so much about ourselves, how we look, how we appear to others. But it is not about us, dear friends, as we all well know. It is all about bringing honor to the Heavenly Father. And so, true repentance, godly repentance, going to the Heavenly Father and confessing our sin before Him leads to salvation. But a pity that is, I'm sorry, but a grief that is rooted in self-pity only promotes carnality and does not effectually lead us in the steps of Christ. Lesson number five, God is expectantly waiting for us. We recall in the parable that as the son is returning to the father, the father saw him first. In other words, the father was standing, watching, waiting daily, earnestly waiting for the return of this son. And when the son returned, the father did not go into the house and make the steward of the house greet the son at the door and ask for some sign of contrition or to sign a letter admitting that he was wrong and all that he had done or making him grovel, making him wait, making him worry. No. The father didn't even wait until the son came to him. He ran to the son. 
And I think that this pictures the magnitude of our Heavenly Father's heart. I said that the parable might be better entitled the parable of the merciful father because this parable instructs us so much about the character of our heavenly father. <coughs> Various opinions have been floated around in the Christian world over many years about the nature of God and his estimations of mankind and his purposes for them. Through the dark ages, there were the few that would be saved from hellfire's eternal uh, list of torments. And that was held over the heads of many people for many years. And then as the truth about uh, hell came to the fore in the uh, uh, ministries of uh, Brother Russell, um, we left hellfire and its torments behind. But in the uh, separation between uh, various brethren, uh, some forming the Jehovah's Witnesses um, and picking up on the second death, they made second death a terror and made God a very vindictive and judgmental God who would condemn most of those who are alive today to second death because they did not accept the message that was in the earth. Hellfire, the threat of second death, they're both means of intimidation. And are they really effective in encouraging us to serve the Lord? I would say they are not. God has cast out the spirit of fear. He has given us the spirit of love, the spirit of a sound mind and a spirit of wisdom. Various misrepresentations of the Heavenly Father have been wrought upon mankind. We read of the severe man in Luke chapter 19, verses 20 through 22. And this is our Lord Jesus at his uh, coming, uh, judging the servants. Um, then came another, Lord, here's your mina, which I have kept laid away in a handkerchief because I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. In other words, you had no trust in me. And that phrase, you knew that I was a severe man, has been translated, you perceived or you thought that I was a severe man. You know, I always had trouble with that parable for many years, thinking, how is it that Jesus is a severe man when he comes to reckon with his servants? And the answer is, he's not. It is this servant who thought that he was a severe man and thus, out of fear, hid his pound and did not make good use of it. Jesus is an exact rep representation of the Father. In him was the fullness of the deity made manifest in the flesh. If you have seen me, Jesus said, you have seen the Father. Continuing on, Psalm 50 verses 19 through 21 is a very revealing statement about the psychology of those who believe in the Father or profess to. You let your mouth loose in evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's sons. These things you have done and I have kept silence. You thought that I was just like you. I will reprove you and state the case in order before your eyes. Because the Lord had kept his silence, they thought he was one just like themselves. And so much of the fickle, arbitrary, despiteful nature of fallen human flesh has been applied to the character of the Heavenly Father. You know, some seem to have the idea that God is just like us, except that he's 12 feet tall. 
but that's so far below the estimation of our, our true God. Think of the best person you ever met in your life and know that that person next to our pure Heavenly Father would seem almost evil by comparison. The noblest and highest being in the universe is personified in this statement. God is love. And because mankind had not had uh, the Lord speaking directly to them, they took off on their flights of fancy and the theology that they crafted and made him vengeful, vindictive, narrow, hateful. Matthew 18, again on this theme that God is expectantly waiting for us. Matthew 18, verses 10 through 14. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety and nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. The ninety-nine and one is a remarkable example of our Heavenly Father's care. He's not playing a game of percentages. He realizes the beauty, the wonder of life itself. The fearful and awesome manner in which he has constructed the human being. God created them to worship him. And the time will come when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God is expectantly waiting for us. We close this lesson five with a reading from the Weymouth. Weymouth uh, on 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. On Christ's behalf, therefore, we come as ambassadors. God, as it were, making entreaty through our lips. We, on Christ's behalf, beseech men to be reconciled to God. You know, I remember being at the bank a few years ago and uh, doing some Bible student transactions and the check had uh, a Bible student uh, association name on it. And the young lady said, oh yeah, uh, God of wrath and God of fear, right? Uh, as to kind of challenge me as a Christian. And I said, his wrath is only against unrighteousness. And that seemed to quiet her down a bit. Like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. But that's the way it is. And in our ambassadorship for the Heavenly Father in the darkness of this world and in these troublous times, what better motivation, what better message can we have than that God has a plan? And the plan is going forward as he intended it to. And that plan is not just for me. That plan is for you. We on Christ's behalf reconcile people back to God saying that he is the best person I have ever met in my life. You cannot imagine how wise and how loving and how merciful and how patient he is. Lesson number six, and it's a big one, I think. We should rejoice in the good fortunes of others. Apostle Paul admonished us in Romans 12, verses 15 and 16, to rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. 
Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Rejoice in the good fortunes of others. Rejoice in the good fortunes that they may have in family. Rejoice in the good fortunes that they may have in service to the Lord, in opportunities to do for the brotherhood. Rejoice with those who have good health, even though you don't. But I love the balance as well, that our hearts are tender toward the brotherhood and we weep with those who weep. And had the elder brother of our parable been able to do both those things, he would have been blessed in the receiving of his brother in figure from death back to life again. He could have rejoiced at his good fortune and knowing his brother's grief and weeping to weep with him as well. Could we do this with one another every day, brethren? How greatly blessed we would be. More from Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 24. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also on the interests of others. We should rejoice in the good fortunes of others. Well, the scriptures are powerful, and if we could take all six of these lessons to heart, keep them in the fore part of our mind each day, how blessed we would be. To review them in conclusion, the six lessons are these. Lesson number one, one of the great temptations young people face is over eagerness to have the privileges and wealth of life, but not by earning it or being accountable for the responsibilities associated with wealth and privilege. Lesson two, it is not wise to leave your father's house. That is, never leave behind the strong and godly principles that we have been fostered with in service to our Heavenly Father. Lesson number three, sometimes we get ourselves into very difficult and unpleasant situations. God's grace is more than able to deliver us out of them. Lesson four, the action of true repentance and turning to Jehovah God to change your life is exceedingly powerful. Lesson five, God is expectantly waiting for us. The father saw the prodigal when he was yet far away. God is not seeking whom he may condemn and shame and destroy, but seeking to bless all. Whosoever will, let them come and drink of the water of life freely. And lesson six, we should rejoice in the good fortunes of others and weep with them when they have misfortune. Our closing scripture, brethren, comes from 1 Peter chapter 3. Finally, all of you have a unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. And may the Lord overrule 
anything amiss in this message today.